pleasure to introduce you uh, our today's speaker, Professor Dmitry Karlovets from Tomsk State University uh, in Russia. Uh, so he, he will deliver us a talk on vortex particles with orbital angular momentum, models, properties, and perspectives. And I will just remind you briefly uh, the rules of the seminar. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I encourage you to raise a hand, and then I will uh, give you this opportunity. You will ask uh, the speaker. You may ask questions by voice as well, uh, just during the seminar. Okay, uh, Dmitry, please, you are welcome. Thanks, Maxim. Okay, so everybody hears me? Yeah? Okay, yeah. fine. No, no yes, yeah. Okay, I'll start. So um, here's the short outline of my talk. So I will start with non-Gaussian wave packets. So when I'm talking about wave packets, oh, I usually mean uh, both massive and non-massive, that is massless particles like photons. So although I will mostly concentrate on massive particles, that is electrons, first of all, and foremost, and then um, some words about hadrons too. So uh, there are different types of non-Gaussian wave packets, um, either theoretical obtained or generated experimentally so and uh, i will comment on some applications possible applications on them so on some um, theoretical calculations uh, about scattering and collisions of them and about how they radiate electromagnetic waves and then also um, some ideas to be developed so let's start um, so the first thing to note is that uh, this is probably one of the uh, best models of uh, what a uh, vortex particle is. So this uh, looks pretty much the same, but uh, in the quantum domain. So we know from the 1990s that light can carry orbital angular momentum with respect to a propagation axis. So obtained uh, by conversion of Hermit Gaussian modes, Lagarde Gaussian and Lagarde Gaussian modes uh, are eigenfunctions LZ operator, that is uh, operator of orbital angular momentum. Um, so what is so this, although it was realized even before that light can carry orbital angular momentum, so it was about photons. So it was only after that work that it was realized finally by everybody that those. Fine. So um, there are uh, several basic uh, sets of functions widely used, like plane waves, eigenfunctions of uh, momentum operator, like spherical waves. Um, which uh, have some uh, uh, angular momentum and also projection of it, but do not have a certain propagation axis. So uh, somewhat intermediate state between them are and somewhat less known are cylindrical waves. So, and uh, the simplest example of them are called Bessel beams because they're expressed through Bessel functions. So um, they have a certain propagation axis, but they also have a certain amount of angular momentum quantized along this propagation axis, where here is M is the, the quantum uh, of this momentum. So, and there are more intricate states like a reed beams, for instance, uh, some non-normalized states, uh, and here is the solution of the Schrodinger equation, as you see in 1979. So, and there are some generalizations of them as well. So, some words about twisted photons, which is probably the most known example of the non-Gaussian wave packets. So as we know, uh, twisted photons are used as optical tweezers and uh, we can trap, uh, we can confine uh, some small micro particles, mostly micro, but not necessarily only so um, by using twisted photons and focused uh, laser beams. And it was shown experimentally too that, so along with the radiation pressure, there are these trapping forces which can confine particles. And uh, so just if you focus, even if you, focus um, normal Gaussian beam, uh, you have this induced angular momentum. So um, there are several potential applications of them, like for instance, you can up convert energy or rather frequency of these twisted photons from uh, optical range to uh, X-ray and even gamma range, for instance, by inverse Compton scattering uh, of uh, ultra electrostatic electrons, uh, but uh, via other processes too. So we know that uh, these twisted, uh, twisted photons can be generated in the vicinity of rotating black holes on the uh, background of care metric. So we can entangle them. So it was uh, uh, already experimentally realized 
by Tylinger, for instance, and his group. So uh, we know that there are also potential applications in, uh, 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 in transmitting radio signals because the uh, Hilbert space is not limited from above for this photons, and that's why uh, we can increase information capacity of the transmitted signals. Uh, Dmitry, Dmitry, I'm sorry, can I, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so uh, regarding the twisted parts, so, okay, for, for information, I, I, I understand it because it like, gives an additional degree of freedom, right, for encoding. But for other applications, like for, for optical twisting, what, what, what does it give for, like, what is the advantage? Because as I, we, we, you probably can do the twi twisting without these twisted photons. So, uh, so uh, twist, it is about confining particles in a transverse direction. So if you use just plates, you have only radiation pressure, but you can't confine a particle in a transverse plane. So this is basically it. So when you use a focused, a tightly focused beam ideal axial, then you have it. Oh, and uh, a tightly focused beam is a, is a twisted photon, if you will. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, some more details about vortex electrons. It's a more recent uh, field. So, uh, it was theoretically shown uh, back in uh, 2007 uh, that single electron carry orbital angular momentum too. So, although it was, of course, realized even before that work, but uh, finally, the, this, uh, uh, this very work of Bleoch and his co-authors uh, initiated or triggered uh, these, a large amount of works uh, in this direction. So when the first experiments were uh, made uh, three years after that, so 2010, 2011, three groups simultaneously nearly simultaneously generated vortex electrons via uh, electron microscopes. So their energy were 300 keV approximately. So, and uh, what we have already now, uh, we have angular momenta as uh, large as 1000 Planck's constants. And uh, we know that they can be focused, it was also realized, to one angstrom. So, um, of course, not with that high angular momentum with the uh, uh, angular momentum of one, so, but anyway. Um, so, and uh, the more recent development of uh, this study is this called airy electrons. So I mentioned them a bit later, um, and uh, there were also Schrodinger cat states uh, widely discussed now, but not yet realized as far as I know. There are also uh, twisted neutrons generated some six years ago and so on and so forth. So the basic idea how one can generate them is very simple. So uh, we can use a phase plate, so made of, of some transparent material like quartz or whatever. There are also uh, computer generated holograms or diffraction gratings, uh, which can also be make, can be used for that. So, and um, for instance, uh, at the right, you see this uh, diffraction pattern and the high diffraction orders carry orbital angular momentum while the central does not. So, um, to understand what a vortex particle uh, really are, we can draw some analogy to the classical concepts like uh, what is known as angular momentum dominated beams in beam physics, in accelerator physics. So uh, it's a, a approximately 30 year old idea. So, which is also based on the transformation of Hermit Gaussian modes to Aguirre Gaussian ones. And uh, so initially the idea was how to make a very flat beam. So a beam with a ratio of permittances of 100 or so. And it was real, realized in several accelerators already and is highly important for the future colliders like ILC, for instance, in CLIC, uh, where these uh, beams have higher luminosities. So uh, for them, they also have angular momentum, but it is a canonical angular momentum related to the circular motion, so rotation uh, in the magnetic field. And the, uh, the responding angular momentum is not quantized, so it's a somewhat classical property. But anyway, if you measure this in terms of the Planck's constants, then you have uh, angular momenta up to uh, 10 to 8. So it was realized very experimentally for uh, magnetic fields of several Tesla, even lower, and not very energetic particles. So uh, U transverse here is the uh, uh, transverse velocity in uh, uh, velocity. So um, 
wave packets and multiparticles beams are not superficial. So there are even deeper analogies. For instance, uh, uh, there is a, a no of emittance used in beam physics. So when you have a beam of many particles, you can define emittance of them as follows. Uh, and on the right, so there is a similar definition, or uh, actually it's a very identical, nearly identical definition of emittance of a wave packet. So where the, the brackets um, denote the average, the quantum average over uh, quantum states of only single wave what is important is that this emittance is limited low via the Schrodinger uncertainty relation. So, and there are also diagonal uh, x, uh, xp terms, uh, which makes Schrodinger uncertainty relation different from them high. So, and it is very convenient to describe wave packets in terms of these, um, uh, um, uh, of these terms uh, borrowed from accelerator physics world. Uh, because the wave packet phase space is also described by an ellipse equation. So, and uh, the uh, phase space and slope of this ellipse is related to these non diagonal terms, uh, right? So, and again, um, we, we, we can apply this formalism both to beams and to wave packets. So, why the phase space picture is so important or so useful? Because it allows us to uh, uh, relatively easily measure non classicality of the packets in terms of the so-called Wigner functions, because the uh, non-Gaussianity is closely related to non-classicality and self-interference, and the regions where the Wigner functions of the, uh, uh, our wave packets um, are become negative. So here is the simplest example of a coherent superposition of two Gaussians, uh, dubbed the Schrodinger cat state. So, and as you see, the probability density looks like two, two maxima, and the uh, so bigger functions can drop below zero. Um, so there is a, also a close relative or a sibling, if you will, of the vortex electrons, uh, well known from the uh, for I don't know 80 years already or so, called Landau states in magnetic field. So and they expressed uh, through the uh, Laguerre polynomials, generalized Laguerre poly polynomials. Uh, so. Um, an electron rotating or just moving in a, a magnetic field, it has a certain mean radius. And uh, uh, so it is limited from below by this characteristic field, uh, which is on its charge and on a, a magnitude of the magnetic field. So as you see, uh, this motion in the magnetic field is quantized and there are two quantum numbers. The main quantum number or the principal quantum number NH and the L and L is exactly the canonical orbital and uh, canonical or, or angular momentum. So uh, the difference is that for a free pr propagating particle, you don't have the difference between canonical and uh, kinetic, of course, and here you have it. So, but if you switch off the field, it is the canonical angular momentum that finally uh, uh, turns into the magnetic uh, uh, orbital momentum of the free propagating packet. I will show this a bit later. So um, now I will show some formulas that describe free propagating vortex particles uh, obeying Schrodinger uh, equation, but also, of course, Klein Gordon and uh, the Dirac one. So the first of them was obtained by Bleoch and others uh, based on the similarity between Schrodinger equation, the paraxial uh, equation in optics. So, and uh, it has a, also a GUI phase well-known uh, thing in optics, uh, which is T even, what is important. So T means the inversion of time. So um, in our works, we obtained a somewhat uh, generalized Laguerre-Gaussian packet, uh, non-paraxial, which represents uh, an exact non-paraxial solution to the Schrodinger equation, but also to relativistic equations. Um, and here, the important thing is that the GUI phase is T odd. So it depends on time rather than on the distance. Um, why? Because non-relativistic packets spreads with time rather than with the, with the distance. And it spreads even if the packet is at rest on average. So, and this is uh, in, in accord with the general CPT theorem or with the uh, Wigner theorem on inversion of time and quantum mechanics. And uh, this uh, property, which seems to be important only in non-relativistic case, turned out to be quite important in uh, some problems uh, related to interactions, scattering, radiation of the vortex electrons. 
Um, so the bezel beam turns out to be but a special case of this generalized Laguerre packet I have shown. Um, and uh, what is um, important about it is that it has a huge magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment of this packet consists of two terms. One is related to spin and another one is bosonic, is related to orbital angular momentum. And if we calculate it via the generalized Laguerre Gaussian state, so we end up with such an expression where the magnetic moment is proportional to orbital momentum L, and it has also some uh, non paraxial correction. So uh, take a look at this non paraxial correction. So uh, this is the, the small parameter here is the ratio of the Compton wavelength, the uh, transverse coherence length, that is width of the packet. Uh, in the beginning and some initial moment of time. But there is also a term L in the numerator that say for large angular momenta, uh, this non paraxial action is enhanced. So this small parameter realized values are uh, 10 to minus 6 or so, and the corresponding parameters uh, values of L are uh, 1000 or so. So this enhancement is three orders of magnitude. Um, so, and that is why this magnetic moment is huge and uh, such electrons interrelatedly with, with matter and light, with, with surfaces, some with uh, magnetic nanomaterial, and of course with magnetic. So the simplest example is for uh, this transition. And, okay, can we ask a question, Salon? Sure. Uh, I, I have a question regarding this basal beam for, for vortex electrons. Yeah. So like uh, in uh, in uh, for the Maxwell equations you can actually write down the, the expression for the for the vertex beam and it will solve the Schrodinger equation oh Schrodinger sorry for Maxwell equation yeah case of electrons so uh, you, you you also have this Coulomb interaction there so are these uh, vertex beams are they like eigenstates of the interacting Hamiltonian. So, are they a superposition of some of the interacting eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, or they will? So, will... Uh, there is no interaction here. So, we are talking about freely propagating particles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, well, the question is to what extent, uh, especially when you squeeze your packet quite strong, yeah. so how it's robust with respect to. Uh, I will comment on that. Yeah, the good question. So, I uh, tell details. About a, a bit later, but in, what is important to understand is that this orbital momentum and this state like Bessel B, uh, it's an eigenstate of a more general scheme of fields. I also have, have, have a question here. Yeah. So uh, you say that uh, the magnetic moment is split into two parts, right? Exactly. So will you talk about the second one or or uh, like uh, mu s? The first, the first uh, mu s is a classic electron, so it's not interesting for us. So the I, I'm talking about the uh, the second part mu b. Okay, okay, okay. So it's not limited for up, you see, and that is this uh, uh, magnetic moment that we already have in experiments is uh, roughly one thousand times larger than electron. Excuse me, Dmitry. Uh, uh, was already some experiment confirming the strong interaction, magnetic interaction of a vertex beam? Hmm. Well, good question. Well, good question. I know about some experiments uh, with electron microscope, how they interacted, with, uh, let them interact with some magnetic nanomaterials. But on, to be honest, I don't remember if they really. Uh, observed some something that is uh, ambiguously, uh, inambiguously related to the, these huge magnets. But honestly, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. I know that they were obtained, but uh, actually, yes, it was proved. It was proved because the it was proved by the diffraction pattern. So, yeah, they made an interference of these two. With highly twisted uh, beam with a not twisted one, and they registered the uh, fringes. So, and uh, from that, uh, for sure, that the these uh, orbital momentum was one.
1,000. Okay. 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 Um, probably one of the simplest examples, and uh, uh, it's a situation of uh, such a vortex electron, uh, because if you have a huge magnetic moment, uh, you have an enhancement of the uh, mu contribution to the radiation power. So I'm talking about the following. The radiation power, uh, the spectral angular distribution of the radiating photons, radiated photons, uh, this series is a multiple series where the leading term is the contribution from charge, and then the contribution from magnetic moment, and here is some interference between them. So uh, these terms were calculated long ago for uh, normal spinning electrons, plane wave electrons. And uh, so here you have the enhancement of interference uh, in L times. Normally, um, uh, the distribution is attenuated as the energy photon. Uh, and in den denominator, you have the energy of the radiating electron. So this ratio is parameter for quantum recoil and both for spin contribution. But if we have contribution, hands. So, and uh, together with our colleague, with, with my colleague from, um, um, from so we calculated this transition radiation with an ideally conducting plane, uh, but later we will gener uh, we'll generalize for uh, uh, some, uh, some material of finite epsilon. And it turned out that if you have a um, uh, not normal, but an, so uh, an electron in at a certain angle with respect to, to, to this plane, then you have an azimuthal asymmetry. To say you have an asymmetry of the angular distance over the angle theta and theta is the plane perpendicular to the plane of so if you don't have this huge magnetic moment, these distributions must be symmetric. So they are not symmetric, and there is some total angular asymmetry, uh, which can be discussed with the naked eye already for 1,000 L. So you see the, an effect of, uh, of the order of 10 for 1,000, uh, of the order of 10% for uh, 10,000. So Dmitry, may I ask, ask you a question? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the question is the following. Uh, I wonder if this L, large L, can affect the total intensity of the transition radiation, or the only issue is just redistribution uh, over the angles. Could you comment on that, please? Huh. Question. So if you integrate frequencies and uh, so I think it does. Yes. And also, what is the, uh, so, uh, could you turn on the previous slide? Yeah. Right. Okay. So there is electric and, and magnetic part, right, of, of energy. No. Uh, like e, e means charge. charge. Yeah. 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 So so uh, so what are the uh, the the uh, 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 ratio between W E and W E? And the, this ratio. This one. Okay. This interference term divided by the the charge, the leading charge contribution. Okay, okay, thank you. So it was aluminium, by the way. So, and it tur also turned out that uh, frequency dispersion is, is crucially important for, for these predictions to be reliable. Okay, um, so some other things about uh, uh, wave packets. So, along with the magnetic moment, they also have other uh, multiple moments like electric quadrupole moments and so on. So you see, if you have an, uh, um, a, norm a normalized wave packet, so with a finite spatial extent, then along with the magnetic moment, you also have an electric moment where a raw, uh, uh, so average draw is the uh, mean radius of the packet. So, and this uh, electric quadrupole moment increases as the packet spreads. So, and that is why it is important only for non-relativistic particles. But anyway, what I would like to draw your attention to is that magnetic moment vortex electron does not depend on the width of the packet. So it depends only on the orbital momentum L. So the electric quadrupole moment of the packet, which uh, arises because of the non-Gaussianity or non-symmetry of this packet, 
Uh, it is also proportional to orbital angular momentum as long as the mean radius uh, is so, but uh, it also depends on the, on the size of the packet itself. And this uh, size grows uh, as the packet spreads. So it will be useful a bit later. So some words about twisted neutrons. So neutrons were uh, called twisted neutrons with a wavelength of uh, 0.27 nanometers and uh, energy of 11 uh, milli EV were generated some six years ago uh, with the, uh, by international team, mostly from US. And there are some applications of, uh, of them in neutron optics. Uh, some of them were already realized by this group uh, in interferometry, in entanglement, in gray spectrometry, uh, and it is especially interesting for, for our group is that um, there are additional effects related to interference between nuclear force and uh, electromagnetic interaction at low energies. I'm talking about the so-called Schwinger scattering of twisted neutrons on nuclei. So if you let your twisted neutron be scattered by a nucleus, um, then there is interference between strong force and electromagnetic uh, so Schwinger calculated this process uh, back in 1946 uh, with the normal plane wave neutrons, uh, and he found that cross-section depends on the neutron's transverse polarization and on the imaginary part of the nuclear amplitude. So the small a here means the nuclear amplitude. So twisted neutrons, on the contrary, uh, reveals dependence on the helicity and on the real part of the nuclear amplitude already at the Born approximation. So we performed a specific calculation for the old target, and uh, we took, uh, so we registered uh, neutrons scattered at a certain angle uh, for realistic parameters. So, and there is a, a helicity asymmetry in this case, which is not there for ordinary neutrons. So, and this helicity asymmetry is a measure of the uh, phase of the nuclear amplitude uh, to the cross section at the Born level. So this phase, as I as I've just said, is not there for ordinary. Use. So as you see, this um, asymmetry amounts to several tens of percent uh, for normal uh, parameters, uh, which is quite useful because you you can't use the perturbative QCD at these energies, and that is why you have to rely on some uh, specific models, phenomenological mostly models of uh, strong interactions at low energies. So you can uh, kind of study the phase of the nuclear amplitude uh, already at the Born approximation. So normally you, you, you can do that, but only uh, beyond the Born approximation. Uh, okay, a few words about uh, airy and airy electrons. Um, um, so airy photons were generated uh, for the first time uh, in 2007 and the electrons in 2013, also at electron microscopes uh, with the energy of 200 keV. So what is interesting about them, it is also freely propagating particles uh, which seem to propagate along a curvilinear trajectory. So you see it's like a quantum rainbow. So of course that, that is why. Um, so we have AV functions there and the transverse profile looks like a, a two-dimensional AV function. And you have this parabolic, tra um, uh, parabolic trajectory. Um, so in fact, of course, there is no any force. And that is why if you calculate their mean path, it will be rectilinear. So the difference is that uh, the main peak, the main maximum of the area function does not follow the mean path of the packet. So, but anyway, there are also uh, some toys like snow blowers, as they call them realized experimentally, when they put some small particles uh, along the way of this uh, twisted beam. So, and it pushed them uh, in the transverse direction. So there is some distribution of the transverse momentum of them. So uh, there is no net orbital angular momentum with respect to propagation axis, but there is some distribution or uncertainty, if you will, uh, of the transverse momentum and of the orbital angular momentum too. Okay, uh, airy electrons, uh, as long as they attach, they also have electric quadrupole moment, uh, which is also defined by the uh, size of the wave packet. And that is why they also interact differently with matter and light. 
And what is uh, probably uh, interesting is, is that uh, their electromagnetic field is different from the ordinary electrons. So imagine an electron that uh, without any external forces just flies with a certain velocity. Then its electric field is azimuthally symmetric because it, it couldn't be otherwise. So, but if you have an, it is no longer so. Because its transverse profile is not as symmetric and the field will no longer be symmetric too. Um, so, uh, do not show, uh, but uh, the, it seems like uh, uh, the, um, the amount of the effects, so they're, they're really strong. Okay. Is also a property of other non gaussian packets like Schrodinger states. So, this is a coherent superposition of two Gaussians. They all electric at the moment and quite, uh, quite big compared to such moments of some molecules, for instance. So, and I emphasize that the moment is directly related to the fact that the, the state, the wave packet is normalized and it occupies some finite space. I, so I'm to the next part of my talk, which is directly related to quantum constraints and non paroxiality effects uh, in uh, wave packet scattering and radiation. So um, the simplest example is how spread influences the uh, outcomes in scattering. So how influences the scattering cross section. So there are several experiments and uh, uh, theoretical works. Uh, so one of the first examples. 2011, uh, found that the projectile coherence really influenced the ionization scattering in elastic scattering processes. Um, uh, so, it was, uh, uh, and uh, hydrogen, and later some other um, atoms. Uh, so, and uh, there was a long discussion how to describe these effects because the usual theory in tech not describe these effects. So, and, uh, it's so it was uh, only in 2016 that the relatively successful calculations were performed, whereas the authors claim significantly improved agreement as observed during experiment. And, and uh, what is also that they used our approach, our theory that we uh, somewhat unintentionally developed because our initial goal was to calculate scattering of the vortex electrons on S. So the, the first example that we uh, published was about Gaussian packets, and it turned out that simplest example, but not very interesting from our perspective, was uh, turned out to be quite useful in uh, describing these effects. So, about scattering of twisted electrons or vortex electrons. So, here we deal with the scattering of such electrons on atoms, or rather on microscopic atomic magnets. And for white magnets, you have a uh, cross section uh, in the form of a coherent super of the plane wave cross sections average over impact parameters of each atom in the target. So, uh, vortex electron, you have some uh, finite transverse momentum, so you have some uh, opening angle of this cone uh, with their, uh, either 15 or 30 degrees. So, on the dotted red curve um, is a normal plane wave result. So you see the uh, twisting uh, twisted electrons can be distinguished yeah, because uh, they lead to a shift in the angular distributions. So, and you have this maximum uh, exactly at the angle where the opening angle of the cone is. Uh, the electrons were non uh, They had an energy approximately one keV. Um, so uh, uh, target of hydrogen atoms in the ground state so and the Born approximation was used. So what I would like to emphasize is that we are dealing with effects uh, where even in Born approximation, uh, you can connect discernible with the next So Excuse me, Dmitry. Excuse me, Dmitry. Yeah. May you go before, yes. This A squared, it's something like A zero squared, yes? Something like Bohr radius. It's a Bohr radius, exactly, yeah. Yes, in your, in your, okay. Yeah. And then theta K is equal 90 degree, what happened? Uh, it cannot uh, be equal exactly to 90 degrees because, uh, uh, well, it can 
it can tend to 90, but huh, let me think. So honestly, I, I don't know what happens if so for probably the model will no longer be applicable. Okay, so this infinity in the uh, is like zero in the denominator. Ah, you see the denominator. Yeah, it, it was made in paraxial approximation. I see now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here we mean that theta is not equal to ninety, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, if we reformulate this uh, problem of scattering in terms of the phase space, uh, then we can uh, obtain a very compact but very informative formula where the angular distribution of your or effective scattering cross section uh, is represented as a linear functional of the its profile of the Wigner function and of the Born amplitude. So you see that the negative values of the Wigner function uh, do contribute to this cross section, and that is why uh, 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 there is some attenuation of the cross section at certain angles where the negative uh, values of the ring function can be noted, can be discernible. So for that, you need to have um, vortex packets uh, uh, focused nearly to the Bohr radius, slightly larger. So it is not unrealizable, as we know. And we need to have the distance between two maxima of Bohringer cat uh, slightly larger than this width. So uh, this hasn't been realized experimentally yet, for as far as, far as I know. But I talked to some experts, and uh, they told me that it, it is, in principle, can be done. Although, uh, so it, it is not easy, but it can be done. So, and there is some azimuthal asymmetry that again amounts to several percent, up to ten percent or so, um, for realistic parameters. And this azimuthal asymmetry. Uh, is a signal of these negative values of the Wigner function. So we call this non-paraxial regime of the scattering. So again, the, the standard theory does not describe these effects. So the parameters are the same. So hydrogen, uh, one keV approximately. Um, okay, um, I come to ultra relativistic scattering. So the, the QED case, and uh, we take a normal uh, uh, tree level uh, Feynman diagram and calculate either scattering or annihilation. When one of the colliding particles uh, is twisted, it carries uh, orbital angular momentum, and another one does not. And we start the angular distribution of the first untwisted particle and how it is changed as a, as a result of twistedness of the second particle. So the cross section um, is divided, so the general cross-section, which is translated uh, in terms of the uh, uh, of packets of the Wigner functions of both the colliding particles. So it develops two terms. Uh, one of them is standard, uh, incoherent, uh, we call them. So it is, is expressed in terms of N1 and N2. These are Wigner functions. And in terms of the uh, d sigma pw, pw means plane waves. So it is a linear functional of the standard plane wave cross section. When I say plane wave cross section, I mean the standard uh, uh, cross section from a textbook, right? So even at this, even this leading term is not equal to this cross section. So it's a linear superposition uh, of them, averaged over the phase of both the initial packets. But there is also an interference correction to, to this leading term. And this interference, cor interference correction uh, depends on the derivative of the phase of the scattered amplitude. So uh, what is uh, zeta? Uh, zeta here is the phase of the scattered amplitude. Um, so it is clearly seen on this next slide. Uh, if you have uh, this m amplitude, then its phase is zeta. Uh, so what is important is that this thing does not contribute to the cross section at the Born level, at the tree level in a normal QED, so in a standard Q plane wave QED. Yeah? So here it does contribute already at the tree level. Um, although the effects are they, they are uh, weak, but anyway, uh, it is important to understand that these effects are important uh, also for LHC and for other uh, uh, providers. 
so for instance, totem collaborations uh, collaboration uh, devoted uh, several papers to this problem. So namely what uh, they measured in uh, PP collisions uh, interference between electromagnetic amplitude and sun amplitude. And there, of course, this, this phase, uh, they kind of extracted. So or rather not phase itself, but how it depends on the T, Mandelstam T parameter. So here there is a, uh, we propose an alternative scheme how one can measure these by using the quantum wave packets. So by using twisted electrons, for instance. So if you, uh, it's about interference term, a few words about incoherent leading term. Uh, I've just said that it is also different from the plane wave. So we take two examples, ultra relativistic particles. So annihilation of electron positron pair into muons and elastic scattering and muon. So one, one of them being twisted. So then leading uh, represents a standard cross section plus some correction. And this correction is show of the transverse momentum that the initial twisted particle is to the uh, energy uh, in the center of the frame. Yeah. So, and here is some G is some angular dependence. So this angular dependence, dependence is different for different processes. So alter is really small in ultra relativistic case for lepton scattering. Uh, but is uh, only relatively attenuated for hadrons, for heavier particles, because their transverse momentum can be. So for them, you have uh, roughly minus times L. And if you have L, let's say 1000, what we already have, then these effects, uh, these effects of transverse coherence can compete with the second loop corrections to, to these uh, processes. So the of course, these corrections, they're small, but anyway, it is useful to understand how small they really are. Okay, uh, the, some last uh, examples of these effects of quantum coherence in electromagnetic radiation. So uh, I refer to my uh, slides about transition radiation, but here we have written down yet another contribution due to the electric quadruple moment of the vortex electron. So you have the following example. You have a smith purcell radiation. So you have a metallic grating and a twisted electron uh, that flies, a freely propagating uh, electron that flies and spreads about this grating. And uh, as long as it, uh, as it spreads, so it quadruple moment of rows. Um, and uh, this spreading does not change anyhow the uh, radiation for normal Gaussian wave packet without any multiple moments. Those with multiple moments, it does. So, uh, so uh, to, to understand what I'm talking about, let's remember that there are two general types of quantum corrections to the particle radiation intensity. So, whatever radiation process, either synchrotron radiation, Cherenkov radiation, Smith Purcell radiation, transition, whatever, so we have corrections to the classical intensity due to quantum recoil, that is omega over epsilon, um, and spin of the same magnitude. So you have corrections due to interference between charge and magnetic moment, which are L times enhanced. And we also have corrections due to finite coherence, spatial coherence of the wave packet, uh, which is described by the uh, interference between charge and electric quadruple moment. So to be more precise, um, the small ratio uh, turns out to be uh, uh, like this. So it is a ratio of this interference contribution between charge and electric quadruple moment and the leading charge term. So M capital here is the number of strips, the number of the grating period. Transverse coherence length of the wave packet. The internet connection is unstable. So everybody hears me? Fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I already said, By sigma perpendicular squared is um, its maximum value is 10 to minus 6. So it can be 10 to 3. So the number of strips can be as large as you want. So experimentally you can make an, a grating in an optical range. 
So you can make uh, this in a micrometer or terahertz range, right? It can be 100, 1000, so whatever. And then you have nonlinear enhancement of the radiation power um, as a function of the number of strips. So you see the charge, a radiation, normal charge radiation grows uh, proportional to the number of strips. So the higher the number of strips, so the more photons your electron radiate. So here you have a nonlinear enhancement. And uh, for quite realistic parameters, we can uh, note enhancement because uh, such an electron would radiate all uh, its energy uh, much faster than a normal electron would do. Uh, so we took an electron with a non angular momentum. As you see, the OM uh, is orbital angular momentum. So the most important thing to observe this nonlinear effect is not the value of the orbital momentum, uh, but the fact that the rating must be longer than the packet's relay length. That is the length where the packet doubles its transfer size. So for non-relativistic electrons with energies of tens or hundreds of keV, um, uh, this, uh, 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 this relay length can amount to microns or millimeters for lower energies, but anyway, so it is relatively short compared to the microscopic length of, of a real grating. So it is also interesting because um, so uh, this nonlinear effect, uh, it's a kind of, it kind of shows that a charge inside electron packet is not concentrated in the center of the packet, but it rather is concentrated on this donut shape, right? So, because normally uh, in, uh, again, standard calculations, so the, uh, a particle, an electron radiates as if its charge were concentrated in a point. So just in the center of, 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 uh, of a particle. So here is not the case. So here we have this nonlinear effect um, because the charge kind of spread over the entire wave packet. So in this sense, the, uh, this uh, wave packet behaves like a, a many particle beam rather than like an elementary particle. So again, the particle is elementary, but there is some spatial distribution of charge and there is a, a, a knot in the center. So some ideas to be developed at the end of my talk. Um, so we have twisted neutrons, we have twisted electrons, airy packets and so on and so forth, but we don't have uh, any heavier particles uh, like protons and ions, I mean, charged particles or neutrons we do have. Um, so, and here we can borrow some ideas realized in accelerator world. So uh, there are two uh, methods with a magnetized cathode used to generate uh, angular momentum dominated beams. So they put a cathode inside a solenoid and then the electron beam that is emitted from the cathode uh, doesn't carry any kind of angular momentum, but it does carry some uh, canonical angular momentum. And that is why what we say here is that there is a quantum analog, quantum counterpart of this uh, idea. And uh, uh, when this particle uh, leaves the field, leaves the solenoid, its canonical angular momentum will turn into intrinsic orbital angular momentum of a freely propagating packet. So, and there is analogous quantum Bush theorem. So there's a classical Bush theorem known in accelerator physics. So there is a quantum counterpart of the, and uh, uh, the root mean square radius of a wave packet enters here. So for classical beams, it's a statistical averaging over all the particles in the beam. Here is this the average over quantum space of only one single particle. So this is uh, uh, orbital momentum and how it is related to the magnetic field strength uh, on a cathode. And another idea for, uh, uh, especially for ions and protons is, the mag is using magnetized stripping foil. So again, they put uh, uh, stripping foils uh, inside a solenoid, so where they uh, uh, change a charge state of ions. So they strip them. Um, and the quantum uh, counterpart of this theorem of this idea is that again, uh, as long as you change the charge state of a particle, its canonical angular momentum will change too. 
So, and uh, the resultant, resultant angular momentum will depend on the difference between the charge states. Uh, the problem uh, at first glance, the proton and ion wave packets, they are much narrower than the electron are. electrons are because they're heavier. Uh, but the good news is that uh, they do spread. So the quantum wave packet is really spread, and that is why uh, so uh, they, they can be much, become much larger at the distance of nanometers and uh, even larger. So, and that is why if you put just put your ion or proton source or a collimator a bit farther from the uh, stripping foil, then you can get it. So you can uh, get a, a, a large transverse coherence of a proton or ion packet. And uh, uh, when it is stripped, uh, it will be converted into the twisted state uh, when it leaves the field. Okay, um, yet another idea is that the maximum energy of the vortex particles, vortex electrons that we have so far is 300 keV. So can we up convert their energy to several MeV at least? So not get not GeV range. So, and again, we can borrow some ideas from accelerator physics and say that uh, actually the angular momentum of a vortex electron is conserved not only in a longitudinal uh, uh, constant homogeneous magnetic field, but in a much wide, uh, uh, wider class of electric and magnetic lenses usually used to manipulate uh, multiparticle beams and accelerators and electron microscopes. What is also important here to understand is that uh, the transverse extent of a single packet is usually much narrower than that of a classical beam. It means that classical beams are incoherent, so the packets are narrower than the, the, the beam itself. So, and that is why the condition of uh, the field being uh, homogeneous can be relaxed. So uh, we can apply the, the formulas for homogeneous field to describe the evolution of a single packet. So the evolution of a single packet, of course, is described by the quantum uh, equations. Uh, we can solve these equations, so it uh, will be analogous to uh, beta tron oscillations, well known in classical physics. Um, but anyway, so um, we come to my summary. I'm on I'm time, I think. Um, so I just brief, briefly, very briefly described and uh, superficially the emerging field of quantum particle optics. So you see there is a quantum optics and there is a particle optics in accelerators. So we, here we have some quantum counterpart of these particle optics. And we have uh, several types of non-Gaussian packets of electron newtons uh, already generated. And uh, hopefully it will be also generated for protons ions in near future. Uh, and these packets carry intrinsic multiple moments and uh, they interact differently with matter, light and other particles uh, due to these properties. And we know that their scattering outcomes uh, depend on, the, on, on the, these quantum states. And uh, um, so we can pose even a problem of quantum tomography of massive particles. Because in quantum optics, we know about quantum tomography of quantum states of photons. So uh, pretty much the same thing can be done with massive particles. Particles. So we can ask, uh, so when we detect some scattering or radiation outcomes, can we uh, judge on the quantum state of the initial particle that uh, was before the scattering or before the radiation process? So, and uh, the corrections to the standard patterns, as I've showed, they're uh, quite big. So they mount uh, from several percent to tens of percent already at the board level. So they surpass the, um, um, the loop corrections. So I also show that the phase space is quite useful because uh, it allows us to, to relate the negative regions of the Wigner functions to some observables. Um, and I also showed that um, uh, so quantum world can borrow some ideas from the classical world of classical uh, beams in accelerators uh, because there are similarities between statistical physics and between quantum mechanics. Uh, for instance, uh, realized in in, uh, in Bohmian mechanics, right? And because of them, uh, we can adapt some ideas uh, uh, to formulate how one can create uh, vortex protons, vortex ions, how one can accelerate vortex electrons to relativistic energies, and to finally bring them into the domain of high energy physics, where uh, there are also calculations 
uh, how one can use, for instance, spinless, uh, also, I mean, non uh, unpolarized particles, but with a phase vortex, that is with the orbital angular momentum, uh, to study spin physics. Yeah, so there is a recent idea of Igor Ivanov and his team, uh, how one can uh, use these vortex particles, but unpolarized to study spin physics, in, uh, for instance, in a deep inelastic scattering of electrons or protons, and so on. So, uh, yeah, with this, I would like to thank you. Yeah. Uh, may I have a question, please? It's, uh, yeah, please, yeah. Andrei. Please. Yeah, uh, so uh, several silly question. Uh, Dmitry, uh, thank you very much for the great talk. And my question about this is personal radiation. And can we say something specific about the polarization of the radiation in, in this case? Um, the brief question, yes. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the, the vortex particle, uh, so uh, the twisted initial particle change polarization property of the of the final photon yes it does and uh, the, the the second question so you, you partly answer it in, in your summary it's about the possible application in kind of spectroscopy yes this uh, vertex beam okay but maybe uh, uh, the uh, to continue the, this question uh, can we use uh, the for example uh, these protons or uh, polarized uh, spin polarized pot photons or with high angular momentum in uh, tumor therapy, something, some additional degree of freedom, something like this, because you know this is quite popular uh, treatment method of the tumor. So, do you need polarized spin polarized protons for that? No, no, no. I said maybe it, it gives you some additional degree of freedom for more advanced mm. therapy. I don't know. This is a yeah, good idea. I've never thought of that, but yeah. So let, let's think. So yes, what is and... uh -huh, okay. What is also interesting is that there is this uh, proton spin spin puzzle, as you remember, right? So, yeah. and uh, uh, partly, uh, so uh, by by making uh, work, uh, electrons initial electrons uh, in a vortex state, you can also bring some some use to that, yeah, because uh, they are more sensible, so to speak, to this distribution mm -hmm. of spins and angular momentum inside protons. So there are no calculations for now of the scattering so we're, we're aiming at that but so for as far as i know nobody uh, has done that to them okay and the the, uh, the, the third uh, uh, question is about also maybe possible up of some fundamental application so it's about the, maybe it's advanced or efficient method for for registration of such kind of particle, for example, coming from the from the cosmos, from the cosmic space, yeah, maybe because there are a lot of different cosmic particles with uh, coming to us with a very okay. high energy, with a high angular momentum, and maybe okay. so we can give some uh, new interesting information about our universe. Yeah, so uh, it was several years ago that the particles uh, can be twisted and light can be twisted in the vicinity of rotating black holes. So this this thing, yeah. So if we measure, if we detect some particle we're coming to us with a huge angular momentum, so then we can judge on, the, uh, uh, on this black hole of its properties, of its angular momentum, yeah? So these things, uh, these two things are related to each other. So uh, how it is being developed? So honestly, I, I don't know. So yeah, I, I uh, heard the talk some uh, 100, uh, yeah, so one year ago or so. Yeah. So, but no news since then. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. So, actually, I have another question about Chirenkov radiation from uh, twisted electrons. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I understand, if electrons are twisted, then the rotativity of Chirenkov radiation should change. And so, I wonder if we can use this as a probe uh, to, to quantify uh, the angular momentum of electrons. Could you comment on that? To quantify, what do you mean? To determine, to determine L, yeah. let's say. Okay. Um, that's a great question too. So in fact, let's divide all the physical processes calculated so far into those which are directly sensitive to the orbital momentum itself and which are not. So which are sensitive only to the opening angle of the cone. So you see, um, and the Cherenkov radiation is an example of the latter processes. 
So it is not sensitive to the, uh, to the orbital angular momentum itself. So it isn't, uh, but it is sensitive to the opening angle. So it's an indirect uh, link. So, to speak. but uh, there are ideas how you, you can change that. So you can take, for instance, a coherent superposition of two states with different angular momenta in initial state, uh, and then you have it. So, or you uh, can take two times and let the final, uh, let them interfere. So the radiation fields will interfere with each other. So you need to have some interference, either in initial state or in the final state. So if you just have a one uh, single vortex electron and an infinite medium, then you don't have this L dependence of the probability or the cross section. So, and this is a very general feature, in fact, which is uh, applicable not only to Cherenkov radiation, but to the radiation of process in external field and so on. So it's a rather property of this S matrix formalism of the uh, tree level uh, calculation procedure. Okay, thanks. Maxim, can I ask you one, one question more? I hope I have a short one. Uh, Dimitri, so, uh, regarding the question from Ivan Yorsh and the charge uh, and the electron interaction, so does it mean that we need, uh, regarding all these uh, lenses and so on, so that we need uh, low currents? Yes. So it's not only about focusing the low currents. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So uh, why it was electron microscopes that were used initially and still used for to generate this? Uh, it is because of low currents, yeah. So if you have currents lower than approximately one microampere, then you have a single particle regime because uh, there, uh, if the energies are uh, uh, two, three hundreds of K or lower, so then you the, the distance between each single electron is approximately one centimeter and larger. So it's, it's an eternity in, in, in these scales, right? So you, you, you really have the freely propagating packet and uh, nothing it to, to propagate further. It's not the, the same in accelerator, you see? So that is why, yeah, you need to, you need low currents. Uh, and another question, but maybe just a comment or outlook. So you say quantum, uh, quantum particle optics, but are there any pro is there any progress in in quasi-particle optics, right? So if we go to solid states and see, yeah, and sure, some quasi yeah. structures. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right, yeah. Yeah, I even read a paper on that, so uh, about quasi-surface uh, states of, of vortex particles inside. Yeah. There was a question from Ivan. Please, Ivan. Uh, hello, uh, thank you, Dmitry, for the, for the talk. Uh, can you give more comments on uh, what do you exactly call the canonical momentum? So uh, what are you usually emphasize by saying that it is canonical, but not just general momentum? Uh, well, uh, when a particle is an external field, then you have a canonical momentum uh, and canonical angular momentum, right? And the, the kinetic. So I am not sure there is some definition somewhere here. Uh, yeah, I think this is the one. So canonic and kinetic, so they're, they're different because uh, uh, the difference between them is uh, charge times uh, vector potential, right? So, and that is why if you use canonical momentum, then you get a canonical angular momentum uh, and so on. So the, the kind of kinetic. So kinetic is a kind of a intrinsic property of the particle itself, so roughly speaking, and canonic is the, the kind of a shared property of particle plus field. So, so mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you. There are some subtleties here, in fact, because uh, it is important to realize when you create your twisted particle in external field of a solenoid, for instance, then it is born with the zero vanishing kinetic angular momentum, but not vanishing canonical angular momentum. And then canonical is conserved in this wide class of fields. And then when the particle leaves the field, then it's canonical, this canonical angular momentum that finally turns into the intrinsic angular momentum of a free particle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So any other questions from the audience? 
If not, maybe Dmitry, could you comment on, on the process of annihilation of twisted electron and positron? What would you anticipate in this case? Uh, so uh, I refer to this slide. Uh, here we studies, studied annihilation of uh, uh, positron and twisted electron, so into a muon, muon pair. So, um, so the difference of this process, the standard one, depends on uh, how coherent your initial weight is. That is to say, uh, how large it's transverse. Momentum. So electrons transverse momentum can be, uh, well, kV. So probably tens of kV. So you see the, uh, the transverse momentum is related to the, uh, to the width of the wave packet. So uh, we have a packet, electron packets focused to one angstrom. So, okay, it is approximately 10 kV or so of the order of. Yeah, but uh, no more. Uh, and that is why, so in the denominator, uh, energy in the center of mass equal to one GV or, or, or larger, because this formula is applicable only to realistic scattering. So, and that's why you have uh, one KV divided by one GV squared. So you, that is why you have 10 to minus 12, uh, but you the uh, angular momentum. And that's why I don't think this process uh, will be interesting in the near future, to be honest. But it's no longer the case for hadron scattering. For hadron scattering, a transverse momenta are larger, and that is why directions are larger too. Okay, good. Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, so I guess we conclude the seminar with that. And let me announce the next seminar in a week on 3rd of February. So we are listening to three PhD attestations by Daniel Bobolov, uh, Gulnas Rahmanova, and Simon Tenyushev. Yeah, so stay with us and see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>